something that we really need to say here. That's number one is, is there such a thing as consciousness? And, and you have some reservations about that, but you're kind of willing to go along. I'll play the game. Step number two is, where does it come from? And uh, most of us here, we believe that brains produce consciousness. All right. Now, the question is, at what level? And, and where are we going to emphasize our searches? And we can look at the subcellular level, at the cytoskeleton, the microtubules. We could look at the cellular level. Some people think that there's some cells which are conscious and other cells are not conscious or have the capacity for it. You can look at the circuit level. That's what I happen to be interested. I happen to believe that consciousness emerges at the circuit level. Or you could do like some people who think you have to have big, oh. great systems that before you have consciousness. Then there are some people who think, though, you have to have the whole brain. And, and only whole brains can be conscious. And now, some people think, think that you need more than the brain. Yeah, <laughs> some people don't want to use the word consciousness unless you have the, a brain interacting with a lot of other brains. I don't, I'm not very happy with that because but, I think that a totally isolated individual, a cat or a dog that never saw another cat or dog can experience pain but and for, hunger first and of all, thirst. Don't we find this to be absolutely fascinating that they, we go from one level of the subcellular to cellular to, to, to systems of neurons, the connections, the brain systems, the whole brains, the beyond. Th is that the state of play today? Well, you started too high. Proto-consciousness, something from which consciousness is derived, is fundamental and irreducible, a component of the universe that's been there all along, something like spin or charge or, or mass. It's down there, probably at the most basic uh, fundamental level of space-time geometry. And it's probably been there since the Big Bang. Okay, that is a mystical statement that's totally untestable. I mean, you know, it's 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 just Stop, nothing it's so far as testable it's, about it's consciousness. Un, it's untestable. No, there are lots of experiments uh, you can do in mice, you can do in monkeys, you can do in humans. That's what progress is. Progress is not at all these fundamental. So I mean, I think for the record, the experimental program mo many people are doing now is to avoid all these philosophical arguments because otherwise we will be sitting here in a hundred years from now having the same and just focus on where in the brain are the correlates for certain con you oh, know, correlates. emotions. So you're going to give up on consciousness and just worry about correlates for, for the foreseeable future because we have not made any progress. Philosophers, thinkers, scientists have not made their progress well, in identifying... That's because you're tunnel visioned. You're just looking in one direction. Okay, you're looking under the lamppost for your keys because that's where the okay, light is. Okay, possible. But, but where we will undoubtedly make progress, if you look at the spectacular progress in, in molecular science and neuroscience, so if we just focus for now, you know, for the next, let's say, 10 or 20 years, most of us will focus, uh, you know, that's where the funding is, that's where the interest ideas are, that's where the experiments are, we'll focus on the experimental approachable part, namely where the college of specific conscious perception act, thoughts and memories. What about animals? We've touched, I, we've touched me, about this. Let me this. just oh, oh. say something that's crucial when it comes right to animals. From my point of view, that's how I look at it, okay? If you think that consciousness is produced by a brain, then you say to yourself, which parts of that brain are more important in production of consciousness than other parts? unless you're one of those people who thinks it takes the whole brain, which I don't believe for a minute, and I don't think anybody here does. So the question is, which parts of a brain are the most important, and how do you decide? You see which parts of brain you can take away, and the person, or the cat, or whatever it is, is still conscious, okay? And which parts do you have to leave there? unimpaired for the creature to be conscious. And you, in fact, can lose large parts the of your brain. The fact of the matter is you can take out great cupsfuls. There are two places where you can make little teeny, the size of a, the head of a kitchen match, and a person is going to be totally unresponsive. But that doesn't mean they're not conscious, because that could be attention. If you're talking about the, the ACE, well, any particular well, activity. Now, wait a minute. Hold when it. we're trying to decide if somebody's <laughs> conscious, we never see consciousness. Consciousness is like the wind. But they you don't it. see it. What you see are the effects of it. And Unless the wind we measure. You can't measure right? consciousness, Joe. No, wait a you're trying to determine the level of consciousness. You asked a question about animal, yes. uh, animal consciousness. So most of us, I would, at least most biologists would assume that we're all nature's 
children. In other words, most biologists would assume that a rat and a cat have some sensation. They might not know who they are, they might not know about, they might not know about death, but they certainly have pain and pleasure and sensation. You can see red. And so if that's true, you can now do profitable many experiments of the type that Joe was suggesting where you go in either with a surgeon's knife or today using molecular techniques, using uh, molecular knockouts or knock-ins where you can manipulate the brain and then study is this mouse still capable of doing certain things that in humans requires conscious you say knockout, behaviors. That, that means eliminating some genes so it doesn't have a certain function and then you see what it does exactly. if it doesn't have that Turn function. Turn it into exactly. a zombie if yeah. you're lucky. Zombie mice. <laughs> zombie mice. Zombie mice. That's exactly the point. Yes, and I think that is an experimental feasible program. Sure. How would you tell? Uh, we converge. That's my question. We converge. We converge because on zombie mice. I can tell you exactly why. Because if, you, if you're a zombie, there's many things that you cannot do. No, you don't zombie, have logs. How, you how can I tell a zombie mouse from a, from a non-zombie mouse? Because the mouse is not able to do, just like in a human, is not able to do certain types of planning. It cannot do, for example, it doesn't have access to long-term memory. So, so in humans, no, you can see... That's a mouse without a memory and a mouse without planning. Right. You do exactly what you do in disease. Let's say you're trying to study a mouse model for autism or a mouse model for schizophrenia. You, you establish a few you know, relevant facts in humans that have autism and normal humans that don't have autism. Then you try to replicate the same phenomenology in mice. You can do the same thing in well, consciousness. you have to be careful. You, you, might, you might end up with some beautiful mice that won't be able to remember or won't be able to plan. But it doesn't mean that you can then say you can generalize from them about zombies about consciousness, about the human consciousness. You have to be careful. I totally agree. But the history has shown in the last 50 years that if you do this carefully, you molecular can, biology can, works. What, what is it that can we see about brain systems and how they work together and different things in the brain that you're working with that can help us make progress? Uh, usually people take visual illusions, but it doesn't have to be vision. They're just very convenient. And for example, you have an illusion where sometimes you see something and sometimes you don't. Either you can see a vase or you can see two people looking at each other. One very popular technique involves studying, okay, so your consciousness switches constantly. Either I see people or the vase. So where are the neurons that that, that are involved in this switching. If they're the ones that generate my consciousness, then they should show the same switching dynamic as my conscious perception. Because that, that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing an image in one way or another. So if you can find the neurons that are doing that, at least we know those neurons are involved in consciousness. Exactly. How does consciousness impact our sense of humanness? Or does it? Is it relevant? Okay, I got an answer. Go ahead. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends on how you look at consciousness. If it's epiphenomenal, which I think Leslie may be It's implying, artificial in a way. Then it doesn't. However, if it's, if it's causal, if it's something kind of unique and, and has a, a fundamental role in the universe, then we're not merely helpless spectators. We actually uh, have some, something like free will and causal efficacy in this world. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, we jumped several levels there. I mean, <laughs> consciousness and volition are t two orthogonal subjects. They might or might not relate. I don't see that they have to relate. You can be perfectly conscious. Consciousness can perfectly well exist. And free will might be an illusion. It might be. Um, but I, I don't think so. say, I mean, they are orthogonal subjects. No, no, usually consciousness has two aspects for, that has for, had for a long time. And, and that doesn't mean you can't separate them, but they usually are together. One is the awareness thing, that it's on the sensory side. We have qualia. The other thing is that we've, we have volition, that we, that we do some things consciously rather than automatically. Okay, so that's, another, that's the other side of consciousness. That is that we, had, that we have a conscious And both are action. intrinsic to our humanness. Well, no, the well, yeah, but they're intrinsic to cats and dogs, too. I mean, what, what makes humans special is not being conscious. I mean, aren't we all agreed about that? Or are it depends we? if you believe in free will. I think the best model well, for that, volition... Then a cat should also have, can also have free well, will. We don't, that that do things we don't know that it doesn't. We don't know that it doesn't. What makes the dogs make A yeah. hundred years, are you going to use the word consciousness? That could be, if I'm still alive, well, <laughs> that could be a cop because life could be a quantum coherent state. But let That's me just talk answer. about... That's yeah, a meaning statement. <laughs> Let me talk about volition because uh, choice is something very important and the best way that I understand it is through this quantum paradigm. Quantum computing is coming along uh, like, a, like a, a freight train I think. It's going to really revolutionize information technology. It utilizes the property of quantum superposition in which things can be in multiple states at the same time. So whereas in a classical computer we have a bits of one or zero and in quantum computation, we have qubits of 1 and 0, for example, which communicate. So let's say we're making a choice. We're going to decide what to have for lunch, Sp spaghetti, pasta, sushi, whatever. One possibility is we have a quantum superposition of all these possibilities that then collapse, collapse the wave function to the specific choice 
I'll have sushi. <laughs> lot, a lot of concepts I mean, there. This is, <laughs> quantum, this is what people know as, this is what Gal <laughs> Galman derived is quantum mysticism. You're, sp you're, you're using these words, there's no ex A, the brain, at, at, well, at, the brain is papers, a so Let, me, let quantum, me follow up what he just said, and get back to the question of will, okay, free will, whatever you want to call it. And it has specifically connected with what Christoph said. Some things you do, you take responsibility for. You say, I did that. Other things, like dropping something, for example, stumbling, you don't take responsibility for that, okay? And in fact, there are certain conditions which he mentioned and to which you alluded, where human beings have some brain damage. They do some things, but they don't feel that they did it. So what we're talking about is the conviction of volition, the feeling that you did it, okay? And you can take exactly the same outwardly observable behavior, okay? A knee jerk or turning the head to look at something, whatever you want. And sometimes it is volitional and sometimes it is not. Right. And what makes it volitional is the person saying, I did that. I, I am responsible for the knee jerking or for the foot kicking or for the head turning or whatever. That feeling on the part of the individual that they did it must have some physiological correlate in the brain of that person. And that's what you want to go looking for. So when you have a situation where you can do it either volitionally or automatically, what you want to know is what's the difference in nerve cell yeah. activity that characterizes that conviction of volition. Well and said. But well how said. Do you know that I want to ask happening? a final question for everyone, and this is uh, as if we were here 100 years from now discussing the same subject, where will we be at that time? We'll find out that we had to leave behind the ideas that we were going to discover anything about the human feeling of being aware. We're going to leave behind the idea that that was to be discovered at the level of the subcellular, the cellular, the neuronal, that all of those were too low. And that while we used the techniques that we had to look at these low levels, ultimately we had to be able to understand the brain in its highest and most complex kinds of cognition and the interaction of brain and brain social systems at that high level of complexity to understand the phenomenon. Okay. Joe? I think it's going to take a hundred years for people to accept what I already believe. That's it. That's the show. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>